start recording again. Um, hello, everyone. So it's, it's a, we, we can directly jump into the next talk. Uh, so it's a, a, it's a pleasure having here uh, Nicola, uh, who has uh, been also a very active uh, part of the, of the summer schools for, for, for many years now. Um, he's going to be uh, giving a talk about uh, some open source software they are developing at Segomine, which is a um, startup uh, here in Cambridge. I think this is going to be a shared talk with uh, a few other people uh, there, um, like uh, Henry and also uh, John. Um, so the Nicolas is the, the director of, of research in Second Mind, um, and uh, we are very looking forward to see uh, what uh, you are going to show us, Nicolas. Great, thanks, uh, thanks Javier for the uh, introduction. So this will be a talk with uh, with a few colleagues from uh, from Second Line, and we'll basically be speaking uh, on behalf of a lot of people, like other colleagues at Second Line, but also other people that contributed to the projects we are going to talk about. So um, I'll start with a brief overview of the of the company. So we were founded five years ago. We are based in Cambridge. We are 55 employees at the moment, and uh, to date we've raised uh, around 50 million pounds. So we are past uh, Series D. So what is it we're doing? We are machine. We are doing machine learning for automotive innovators, and our approach is basically to develop a software as a service that offers advanced probabilistic models and uh, advanced Bayesian optimization to the automotive industry. So the main area of applications for our software as a service is powertrain optimization. And, uh, and one of the core thing of the company is to be uh, rather heavy on the research side and on the innovation. So um, uh, Second Mind Lab is basically the research branch at, uh, at Second Mind. And uh, I've included here a picture of all the people that are with us. We've had a new placement starting who started this morning, so we should have another uh, picture in there and, and another name. Um, okay, so what's the role of Second Mind Labs within the, the company? So um, we make sure that we are at the forefront of, of innovation. We make sure Second Mind is recognized as a, as a house that has a lot of expertise. And uh, we also provide within the company uh, in technical insights and, and, and expertise for the customer problems we are tackling. In the practice, what's keeping us busy? So I guess the first component is to do uh, core research, classic research. We do publications. Uh, the other thing is to develop the toolboxes that we are going to talk about today. So for Gaussian process models and for Bayesian optimization or active learning in, in general. And, uh, and finally, uh, we provide technical expertise for the customer problems. Okay, so um, that's the outline of the, of the talk today. I'll uh, talk about why we are embarking on an open source software journey. Uh, I'll uh, briefly outline what our design principles is, and uh, then we illustrate for three of our toolboxes, uh, GP flow, Trieste and Marco Flow, uh, what are the functionalities that are offered and hopefully illustrate some of the design principles. Okay, so here's an overview of our ecosystem. So we are developing several open source toolboxes that are implemented in Python and, and TensorFlow. We have GP Flow for Gaussian process models, uh, GP Flux for deep Gaussian process models, Marco Flow for GPs for time series and then Trieste for Bayesian optimization and, uh, and active learning. We are obviously uh, developing more tools than, these, uh, than th these four, but these four are the ones that are open source and we chose to expose to the outside world. Uh, the bits that we chose not to expose is things that help us create some links between these, uh, between these libraries, things that help us tackle a bit more directly the customer problems or all the things that are linked to the deployment of, of these models. So what's the main aim behind these, uh, these toolboxes? So the first one is to uh, have a solid ground to develop new research ideas. So most of the paper that we write will have experiments and these experiments will be implemented with one of these framework. 
And we also use the, the toolboxes to have like good tools for fast prototyping. When we receive data from a customer, we want to be able, like hopefully in one day, to get the first idea of uh, what would be the value we could bring on this problem or what would be the accuracy we could expect. And uh, finally, we see these toolboxes as the core building block for our product. So they will do the heavy lifting in the background. So the strategy uh, for developing this ecosystem is to focus on generality, to have good coding practices, and uh, we, we chose to embark on, on open source. Um, so why embarking on an open source journey? So it wasn't part of the strategy of, uh, of the company in the first place, but uh, we did change our mind uh, down the line. So I think those are the five factors that uh, made us change our mind. The first one is that I think we have a better understanding of the value we deliver as a, as a company. Uh, people, especially people in sales, can be a bit uh, afraid when you say you want to open source some of the tools. Uh, lawyers would be afraid too because they think you're going to leak some of the IP and you're going to reduce the valuation of the, of the, of the company. But I think there's a very good case to say that the the value doesn't come from uh, from the tool themselves, but the ability to deploy these models and all the expertise we have around these uh, around these tools. The second uh, main reason for open sourcing our, our tool is that we see it as a very effective way to gain code maturity quickly. Basically, when you're going to design a new a new tool, you're going to get it wrong just because it's too difficult to to nail it in the first place, and you don't know ahead of time what are the actual constraints you should, you should account for. So a good way to get maturity for some code is to be exposed to more problems. So you can test your architecture choice, you can see what are the limitations, you can identify bugs and all these things. So it's either something we can do ourselves by trying to tackle more problems, talk to more potential customers, or just by having our tools outside in the wild. It's, it's a very great way to, to collect feedback on it and to improve it. Um, it gives visibility to Second Mind. We wouldn't be here uh, talking today if it were not for these open source toolboxes. I also think it really helps to get the right customer in because we get people that come to us because they know us for uh, what we do with GPFlow or with uh, Trieste. And they are people that will have a technical mindset and we have a technical mindset too. So it's much easier for us to, to discuss with, uh, with these people. And finally, something that uh, I see as very important is that it's a great motivating factor for the people that are working on it. You have a sense that you contribute to a, to a, to a greater good. You have feedback from the outside saying that, uh, okay, I've used your tool, or you can see other people using it. So that's quite, uh, quite rewarding in the, in the end. Okay, so what are our design principles? It's not something that we have uh, written in stone anywhere. It's something uh, we've collected when presenting this presentation, but I think it gives a it gives a reasonable overview of uh, how we our approach uh, to writing software. So, the first one is to see these tools as coll collaborative projects with with a clear scope. So we try to make sure uh, many people can contribute or can use these uh, these projects. Uh, if you're not familiar with uh, with a Git uh, or the GitHub workflow, and uh, and you don't know what pull requests are and code review are, I would I would suggest you you have a look because this is a very very great way to have collaborative projects, uh, either for big scale projects like the one we are discussing at the moment, or at a medium scale project, or even for small projects, it's it's really worth it. Um, Yes, and we also use GitHub issues for collaborative design, so people can raise issues and they are discussed together um, asynchronously. And uh, out of the discussion, we hope that I don't know, a, a good pattern will will emerge, and someone will uh, will be happy to to implement that. Uh, another thing that is helping us a lot, I think, is to have a clear scope for for the projects. Uh, there is a tendency to, uh, I think, a natural tendency to grow uh, code base because you want to add functionalities. Uh, because you need it, but then it is more and more code to, to maintain, and it makes the project uh, more difficult to refactor and uh, yeah, less and less convenient to, to use in the end. So we try to uh, limit the scope of the, of the projects and not make them a large catalog of, of methods. 
So for example, when we write a new paper, we are not going to include the code into GPFlow. We'll import GPFlow, uh, um, locally have the subclasses that we are interested in, and, uh, and then run our experiments. But it doesn't mean that we'll push the new method to, to GPFlow. So maybe one way to put it is that we aim at developing frameworks and not really tools per se. So uh, modularity is something we pay a lot of attention to. So the idea here is to identify what are the key methods and building blocks for what we, what we want to do and make sure one like specific instantiation of, of a method or a building block can be substituted for another. So that makes the tool more versatile, but it also makes the design more difficult because it's not necessarily easy to uh, abstract the right uh, quantities. And uh, yes, and we really want users to be able to have their own subclasses for the method that we that we propose, so that they can write their own, say, kernel in GPFlow or their own acquisition function in Trias, for example. So another important thing to us is test and continuous integration. So we try to have an extensive unit test coverage for our code. So the point here is to uh, help us having less bugs and be more confident about the quality of the code. Uh, it also makes the code much easier to refactor because if you do a refactor, you know what you're breaking right away. And if you if you make sure that you fix uh, the text with the test, which means which doesn't mean modify the test, but uh, modify the code such that the test pass, uh, then if your code coverage is good, you should be confident that uh, you don't have an issue with your refactoring. Then when it comes to continuous integration, this is just like running all the, um, all the tests, the unit test and the integration test uh, at each pull request before it is merged. So each time you add a new functionality, you need to add new unit test or integration test so that the code coverage stays good. And you cannot make merge your code if some of the tests break. So that's, that's a way to ensure that the, the, the code we offer is, uh, is of good quality and is robust. Uh, community building. So I think the, the development and the quality of typically GPFlow is driven by an active community of users and contributors. So we have Slack uh, workspaces, one for GPFlow and one for the other toolboxes so that people can uh, chip in, ask for help, uh, give feedback, or uh, yeah, just uh, comment on the things they are doing with the toolboxes. That's always of interest to us. And uh, the other thing is we use GitHub issues so that people can report uh, issues or feature requests or uh, bug reports, basically. And, uh, and finally, um, redesign when necessary. So I said earlier that we can't get the, the design right in the first place. So we do reserve the right to do uh, the refactoring uh, that, that is needed. So maybe the, the code will break if you, if you depend on one of these toolboxes, but we really believe this is, uh, this is for the best. And with this, I'll hand over to John who will speak about GP flow into more details. Uh, thank you, Douglas. Um... Good morning, everybody. Uh, my uh, my topic will be GPFlow, which is our uh, core GP modeling framework that we use at Second Mind for all of our customer engagements and uh, most, if not all, of the uh, research that we undertake. So GPFlow uh, is a Python package which uses TensorFlow uh, as an implementation framework to provide Gaussian process models. And as uh, and Nicholas mentioned, we aim to build frameworks rather than uh, batteries included enormous packages. So GPFlow is a framework for variational inference and MC-MC Gaussian process models. And this tight focus allows us to really improve the modeling capabilities of GPFlow without having to carry a lot of additional code with us uh, along the way. That code definitely exists within our ecosystems, but uh, it allows us to really allow GPFlow to be a very focused uh, framework for research projects and our industrial applications. 
So GP Flow, the first release of GP Flow uh, was all the way back in uh, 2016 and has been adopted by Second Mind from uh, early 2017. We, I, I think it, we have been, we have employed all of the principal contributors since then, on our, uh, because there is a large community that may not have always been true. Components from GP Flow, as uh, Nicholas mentioned, uh, the sort of the design, the composable design with the built blocks that are brought together to build, build up uh, larger objects models. These components have been used in Second Mind uh, for all of our customer projects. But of course, there is also a large user community, and there are uh, many downstream projects on GitHub. And the, the paper, the, the JMLI paper, has been cited many times. And this uh, really goes back to how GPFlow is a really focused framework that can be extended by users for various different purposes. And it allows GPFlow to remain focused on um, what it is good at. So providing uh, variational inference and MC, MC character process models. Um, do I have control of this slide deck or am I uh, going to have to say, oh, thank you. Nicholas. Um, so the, the building blocks or the components in GP flow are the uh, natural objects that you'd expect to find. So there are well-defined interfaces for kernels, for inducing variables, for models. And these, uh, these objects can be uh, combined in various different ways to build up um, uh, models for doing, do inference in those models in various different ways. I have copied here a table from the documentation describing a spread of models in GP flow. This is not, ex this is not uh, comprehensive for the model in GP flow, but illustrates how uh, you can solve various different problems with various levels of specificity and uh, using different inference techniques. And GP flow will provide the models for doing that. Uh, so we can see that, um, that there's, well, yes, there's a set of models. Uh, other models that the GP flow provides uh, some reparameterizations of these models, and there are um, uh, GP LVM models as well. But again, we wanted to focus on the core functionality. GP flow has a very wide selection of kernels for different purposes and a natural API for combining kernels using some of the features of Python, the Python programming language. So you can write uh, mathematical expressions, linear combinations of functions of kernels, sorry, and uh, this will be uh, assembled and compiled into uh, the combination kernel that you want to use. So this is an example of how we are making best use of the Python programming language to facilitate uh, building models. And we move on to the next slide. So this co composability that Nick has mentioned is illustrated uh, very naturally by looking at how we can turn a, a regression problem into a classification problem or regression model rather into a classification model. So it, it really is as simple as uh, swapping out the likelihood for the likelihood that we want to use for the problem. And uh, the illustration I have here is a, a multi-class model with uh, three classes, but all we've had to do is replace the likelihood in the first instance, uh, which is a, a dummy likelihood with the, uh, the multi-class likelihood. So this is really the strength of the uh, composable design that you can swap out building blocks for others and everything will just work. In the background, we use a lot of the features of Python to uh, provide the right implementations of inference methods, depending on the combination of, of kernels and inducing variables that you want to use. Uh, but this is handled uh, in the background. As a user of GP Flow, you do not need to, need to know how this is done. You can just rely on the types of these objects producing the right uh, results. And move on. So one really great example of this in GP Flow is how it was possible to introduce a, a the multi-output framework and the inter-domain inducing variables for inference. Uh, so this, this plot, it, again, is taken from the, um, the documentation and uh, illustrates a particular multi-output uh, model uh, that is included in the documentation. But if we, if we could advance one slide, we can see how uh, this naturally fits into 
sorry, I need to go through. step forward. We can see again how this naturally fits into the existing model. We do not need to uh, handle, uh, think about different models. We can just replace uh, our kernel uh, using variables with the appropriate multi output um, equivalents. And we are able to solve multi output problems uh, very naturally. And again, like I say, the um, inference is handled by, um, by the Python types in the background. So as a user, you don't have to think about how, uh, which particular implementation is being used. This is handled for you. Go forwards. So an, another great example of how we are able to reuse our components is in uh, GPFlux, which is a, a parallel library to, to GPFlow. And it uh, gives us the capability of building uh, deep Gaussian process models out of the, the building blocks that we have in, in GPFlow. And this is a, this is a very powerful capability, uh, which takes advantage of uh, Keras. So what we want to do with uh, GPFlux is um, avoid writing code as much as possible. So we use the building blocks from GPFlow, we use all of the infrastructure from Keras and the APIs from Keras, and we can assemble uh, deep Gaussian process models uh, very naturally using these two. Uh, very powerful toolboxes. And we can see on the left the advantage of using, or sorry, we can see in these two images the difference between using a single layer uh, Gaussian process and a two layer Gaussian process, and how we get a much better fit to this, uh, this data set on the right hand side using the, the, the two layer Gaussian process. If we step on one, foot, one slide, we can see how, uh, how this can be assembled. So we see the Keras model is built up out of, of layers. These, um, these GP layers are using the, the, the GP flow uh, objects. And uh, we can compile and uh, fit and predict using the Keras API. So this is a, a, a very powerful marriage of the, um, the models from GP flow and the APIs from Keras. And once you've built a Keras model, it is you are able to hook into the very wide TensorFlow ecosystem for uh, saving and loading models, for serving models, for doing an awful lot of stuff with um, that, that you'll need to do if you want to use these things in uh, production systems. Thank you. So before, uh, um, before uh, we jump into the next section, maybe this is a good time to take some questions so that people are, are writing in the, the chat. Is, is that okay with you? Uh, uh, yes, I don't know if we want to, do we want to assemble the questions? For, yeah, I think um, um, I, can, I can read them for you. Um, so everyone is aware. So I think the first one was for uh, Nicola actually. Um, it says, you did not explicitly list external contributions to your tools as an open source benefit. Is that summarized under gain maturity quickly or do you not have many external contributions? Yeah, yeah, I, um, it, it goes under um, gain maturity more, more quickly. We, you also have to be realistic when you launch uh, a new project. It's a, you'll have to convince people like the project will have to be good enough so that people want to use it and want to contribute to it. We, we do are uh, getting uh, contributions from the, from the outside for, uh, for projects, but it's not, uh, if the reason to open source is to get free manpower on the, on the tool, this is not a, a good reason for doing it. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so there's another question. I think this is, this is also for you. It says, how uh, come your team decided to use GPFlow, for instance, not GPyTorch again, for example? What are the main criteria for choosing one specific software developed by the other team over many others? I'm very embarrassed to ask such a stupid question, but it's simply just of, out of curiosity. No, I, I think it's a, I think it's a very good, uh, good question. So GPFlow was a natural uh, choice for us because uh, we were interested in uh, TensorFlow in the in the first place. Then it is also the case that we had uh, James Hensman as one of the first employee of the, of the company. And James Hensman was one of the uh, creator of GPFlux with um, Alexander Matthew. 
So we had this bias to go towards the tools that we know well and that we know we can uh, we can improve upon. Yeah. Another question is: uh, Can you say something about how GP Flow compares to GPI, for instance, in terms of uh, features and numerical stability, etc.? Yes. So I think the the tools are quite uh, quite similar. Uh, GP flow can be seen a bit as a spin-off of GPI, but uh, with implementation uh, relying on TensorFlow. Uh, there is a bit of a difference in the philosophy between the two projects. However, the GP flow will do a bit less handholding for for you. Uh, it's probably something that we want to improve in the in the future to make the tools uh, like easier to use for people that are not experts. And uh, and also for people that know what they are doing, but to have a bit more functionalities. For example, if you have a Cholesky uh, error in, in GPI, it will automatically increase the the jitter level. The in GP flow, we don't have that at the moment, but that's the kind of thing we would like to to add. GP flow does not include any uh, plotting tools. For example, I believe there are some uh, you can plot models in, in GP in GPI, for example. Yeah. And the, the last question um, that is there is like, uh, how do you think we can encourage companies to move towards open source? And what do you think of companies like Boston Dynamics that takes a lot of research from the community but don't publish as much? So it, it was not it was not easy for us to 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 convince leadership and to convince the board and and everybody that uh, these tools should be should be open source. In the first place, we are also benefiting from uh, GP. From GP flow that was that pre-existed uh, second line, right? So we also were consumers of this uh, open source effort, and uh, and we started with okay, let's have our own internal fork of of GP flow. But soon enough, we realized that it was just more complicated to try to maintain two versions at once, and we were actually contributing to the two of them. So um, I don't know, I don't want to comment too much on on other companies, but. It, it is uh, some people would be sensitive to why uh, open source can be a good choice in a, in an industry context. Others will be more difficult to convince. Thanks, Nicolas. Uh, we, we have another question, but uh, I, I don't want to take uh, more time for this now. So we can go ahead with the, with the talk and we can take the, uh, this question and other questions that people may have at the, at the end. So I, I let you go ahead with the, with the talk now. Okay, great. Henry, the, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, bro. Okay, cool. So I'm going to be talking about um, the second mind spacing optimization efforts. Um, so we have something called Trieste, which is a fairly recent Bayesian optimization library. Um, so I hope you were all at Javi's uh, Bayesian optimization session yesterday. I'm not going to bother to try and explain any of that. Um, so that will have been helpful context. Uh, but the, the point of Trieste is that we have some reliable component that we can use within our customer solutions. Um, but also something that we can access as a platform for our research. So as I said, this is a very recent package. We only first released it at the end of 2020. And actually, we have yet to do a major release. So it's very much a work in progress. Um, and we encourage contributors um, and kind of quite major developments. Um, but the overall goal of this is just to have a very flexible platform um, that you can use to solve kind of quite custom based on optimization problems. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I thought I'd just give you a little bit of context about the sort of problems that we internally, so for our customers, use Trieste for. Um, so these aren't kind of the standard based optimization problems that you would discuss yesterday. Um, we have some kind of specific attributes that kind of come up all the time. Um, so actually, we have multiple objectives for pr pretty much all of our problems. Um, so I've, I've presented that kind of in, in this slide. It's not going to be a great overview, but um, just to give you an idea. So imagine on the bottom left of this slide, we have two different objectives. Um, and we're trying to find kind of the blue area for each of those. Um, what we actually want to do is find something called the Preto set. So that's this red line in the middle plot, um, which denotes the set of solutions um, upon which you can't actually improve in one objective without getting a degradation in the other one. Um, so if you're solving one of these problems that has multiple objectives, you typically want to find this red line and report that back to the customer. Um, in practice, it's not a nice little red line like this. It could be a very complicated surface. Um, but that's kind of a, an extra complication. And that's something that Trieste is really targeted to deal with. Um, we also typically have constraints. So like pretty much all real world optimization problems have got some constraints. Um, and, and often these are unknown, so we actually have to learn these from the data. 
So they require like extra Gaussian process models. Um, and we end up kind of with surfaces that look a bit like uh, in the bottom right here. Something that's very niche to, I think, our problems that we tackle, we also have very kind of large batches um, and very large data volumes. And um, so standard Gaussian processes are typically not sufficient. So I'm going to go into that in quite a bit of depth. Um, and we often kind of have non-standard observation noise. So we might have weird likelihoods that we have to deal with. Um, but basically, these are kind of common properties to most of our problems. And actually, these are what guide our research. So this is the sort of thing that we focus on. Next slide, please. OK, so I could spend ages talking kind of on a technical level about all the features um, of Trieste. So I could talk about how it's very modular. Um, so in this plot here, we have all of the different um, parts that Javier will have talked about yesterday within a Bayes optimization loop. Um, and Trieste is with all of these apart from the models. Um, but actually, any single part of this of this kind of framework, you can swap it out for any other um, code from TensorFlow, basically. So you can add in your own training schedules, your own optimizers, the acquisition functions. Um, and crucially, um, we can actually hand in any models from like any of the other second mind libraries, so from GPFlow or GPFlux. I'll give some concrete examples of that in a moment. Um, I can also kind of go into detail about how it's very flexible. Um, so we've set it up so that we can handle multi outputs, we can handle list of models. Um, so it's very easy to specify kind of quite complex scenarios. Um, and we actually have something that's quite unique, which is a uh, acquisition rule abstraction. Um, this is um, nice because it kind of decouples how decisions are made and how observations are gathered. Um, so this sounds a bit wishy-washy, but in practice this means that um, we can make a decision and actually get something quite different back and the whole loop will keep working. So if you imagine that you um, decide you want to make a decision at one point, but then practically the customer can't actually make that decision and just choose it somewhere else, they can hand that back. Um, or if you say, okay, I want to try um, evaluating the function at a particular point, um, and the customer actually collects lots of data around that point, our loop doesn't kind of break down, which is what you would see in a lot of other Bayesian optimization libraries. Um, but actually in, in, in the rest of this talk, I'm gonna focus on kind of the interesting research um, that has actually been enabled by this very modular structure for Trieste. Next slide. So I have, I have three um, things to focus on here. Um, each is around kind of an interesting piece of research that's been yeah, enabled by Trieste. Um, so firstly, we've, we've done quite work, a lot of work on scalable Bayesian optimization. So I alluded to this earlier, uh, but the idea is, can we push Bayesian optimization to handle much larger data volumes than, than normal? Um, and due to the nice kind of modular structure of Trieste, we can easily plug in uh, sparse GP models from, from GPFlow. Um, so that means we can handle very large data volumes, uh, but we can actually also get very large batches for batch based optimization by having very efficient acquisition function implementations, uh, courtesy of some, of some decoupled Thompson sampling implementations that we have in GPFlux. Next slide, please. Um, so I've just kind of got two plots from, from that paper. So just showing you that Trieste they can do this very kind of uh, large budget optimization. So on the left here, we have the kind of standard regret props that I'm sure Javier showed you yesterday. Um, but in the very bright colors, we have standard Bayesian optimization acquisition functions um, on standard Gaussian process regression models. And they can tend to conk out around a thousand points where we can't fit um, the GPR model, the Gaussian process regression model anymore. Um, so actually, you see that by using an SVGP um, with Trieste, we're able to keep optimizing for much, much longer um, using a much larger optimization resource and actually find um, much more high precision uh, minima. Uh, on the right, we're able to really push the limits of um, what can be provided with base optimization. So actually we performed a molecular search task. So trying to find um, some high performing molecules from a set of uh, 25 million molecules. Um, and we were able to, to do a Bayesian optimization loop using sparse GPs uh, that had a budget of 120,000. Um, so this is kind of quite a unique feature of, of, of Trieste is that we're able to pull in the SVGP. So the sparse variational Gaussian process from GP flow. Next slide. Uh, the second point is that we can also leverage even more advanced GP models. So John alluded to these before. So we have GP flux, which is a deep Gaussian process library. And actually for many functions, so particularly non-stationary functions, you can't really get away with modeling them with a standard Gaussian process. Um, but actually by using Trieste's modular structure and pulling in uh, the deep Gaussian process from GP flux, um, we're able to, to optimize these functions very efficiently. Um, so on the left, on the top here, we have a non-stationary function with this kind of, uh, which 
it's very hard to actually optimize using stand, standard Bayesian optimization. So in the middle, this is what we get if we try and fit a standard Gaussian process model to some data sampled from this function. And you see it doesn't really make much sense. Whereas a deep GP model is able to extract kind of relevant structure. And actually, if we look at the regret from a Bayesian optimization using either a Gaussian process or a deep Gaussian process, we see that actually the deep Gaussian process is able to provide again, much, much more um, effective Bayesian optimization. Next. Um, so this is the, the third and final point um, is that actually because Trieste is built in TensorFlow, it's been very, very easy for us to prototype new acquisition functions and acquisitions more generally. Um, so we have two papers that we um, sort of prototyped in Trieste. So we have Gibbon on the left and a trust region approach on the right. So they're kind of two uh, very modern approaches for Bayesian optimization. Next slide, please. Uh, and one of the reasons why it was um, so easy to implement these in, in Trieste is just, just the, the autograd um, aspect of TensorFlow. Um, so for Bayesian optimization, it's very important to be able to efficiently optimize our acquisition function, so maximize the acquisition function. Um, so you need gradients to be able to do that. And a huge amount of kind of maybe five years ago, um, Bayesian optimization papers were um, trying to derive gradients for these things. And it's, it's very, very challenging. Um, but as Trieste is built on TensorFlow, we get the gradients for free, and it's very easy to implement new ideas. Um, so for a concrete example, I've um, improved two different ways of coding up expected improvement. On the top, we have it in Trieste. Um, so this is a very, very simple acquisition function. But even this simple acquisition function is actually very hard to code up um, in some other base op libraries. So for example, MUKit, um, where you have to manually code out the gradients yourself. Of course, this is could be viewed as a limitation of Trieste that we can only support TensorFlow-based models. Um, but that's kind of a sacrifice we're willing to make for just this ease of prototyping. And we're, we're quite happy to kind of rely on our internal tools anyway. So next and final slide, please. Um, and this is also kind of a really nice part of Trieste is that actually um, with this very modular structure, so we can very quickly prototype new ideas as well. Um, so we can combine lots of our existing acquisition functions uh, in, basically for free. So with a few extra lines of code, we could prototype these like very different ideas. Um, I'm not saying that many of them were to not to be very effective, but um, it was much, much more efficient than trying to recode all of this stuff up from scratch. So we were able to combine, yeah, so given with multi-object to PO, um, all manner of different things here, basically by being able to pull in um, functionality from different packages, all within kind of the TensorFlow um, and second mind umbrella. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, another, and I guess it's the last um, library open source from Second Mind, which is Markov Flow. So uh, Markov Flow is a time series library, and it implements Markovian Gaussian processes, and it's also in, in TensorFlow. So um, we literally just released it, so you can find it on PyPy and, and on GitHub. And we released it along with uh, a companion package, which it relies on, which is called bended matrices. And it's basically uh, some operators to do linear algebra for bended matrices fast. So they are implemented in uh, C++ along with a reverse port differentiation. And the little plot on the right shows you uh, that when you try to do uh, inference in GPs for, with Markovian GP first, uh, you can scale linearly with number of data points instead of cubically. And that then when you, if you implement, if you implement these methods with our dedicated uh, uh, linear algebra uh, operators rather than with classic uh, for loops, you also uh, are linear, but much faster. So who is using Markov flow? So it has been built, uh, it has been used uh, for customer projects uh, in the past. Uh, and it's uh, also used for research purposes to derive the next um, method in four time series analysis. Um, a tiny bit of theory. Uh, I mentioned Markovian Gaussian processes. Um, it's basically a subclass of Gaussian process with uh, 1D input. So imagine your kernel that just takes uh, time as input. And Markovian GPs are GPs that can uh, be expressed with uh, this equivalent representation as a stochastic differential equation. Uh, if it looks complicated, it's really just a vector that evolves continuously in time. It's following this uh, a differential equation, a linear differential equation, where you introduce 
noise at the same time. So the state is bigger, but then you can, uh, and it evolves in time, you can reconstruct just the process by linearly uh, reading out from uh, S with this uh, H matrix uh, on this slide. Um, so having it as a linear dynamical system, you can turn the inference that you do with normal GPs into uh, Kalman smoothing and variance. Which, is, which scales uh, linearly with the num number of data points. So here is a graphical model of a typical uh, Markov chain with observations. And our, there are many algorithms that exploit the, this chain structure. And they're well summarized. Uh, and also the connection with GPs is, is describing this book by Simon Sarka and Hanno Selin, which I recommend. Um, so about the architecture, the Markov flow really mimics GP flow in the sense that you, if you are familiar with GP flow, you will recognize the classical uh, objects, including kernels. Uh, it also actually reuse a lot of the uh, objects from uh, GP flow, for example, to declare the likelihoods. We don't uh, create new ones, we use the same. And uh, you have the same nice compositionality to build complex models. So uh, currently, it can deal with multi-output GPs, models with multiple GPs, non-conjugate likelihood, and uh, large data sets. And it implements uh, various kinds of approximate inference, including rational inference uh, with natural gradient, or expectation propagation. And something that was also developed at Second Mind is uh, uh, a particular declination of uh, sparse GP for uh, Markovian Gaussian, Gaussian processes, which allows to further scale uh, these models. Uh, and that's been very useful. Uh, so the classic idea in sparse GP is to exploit redundancy in the data set to summarize this data in a, in a, few, in a smaller number of pseudo data points. And you can also do that for, for time series, uh, as can be shown maybe in this picture. Maybe you should check the paper. Um, as an example, um, I'm going to maybe a complex time series model. Uh, here is modeling financial time series, so two log returns. We don't want to uh, model just the signal, we want to measure the shared noise. So we build a model where basically you have three Gaussian processes that uh, are used to model the shared, uh, the covariance of these two signals. So maybe you're familiar with Vishal processes, that's the bottom plot. Uh, you see the evolution of this covariance uh, as ellipses. So at the beginning of the of the plot, um, the covariance is tilted to the, to the right along the diagonal axis, meaning it captures the signals are, sh are correlated. And a bit further down the line, it captures that the signals are uh, anti-correlated. Uh, and there is a, a smooth interpolation in between. Uh, so this is very useful to um, uh, predict in the future this sort of signals. And that's it for Markov flow. Okay, so a very quick uh, wrap up. So uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, writing good research software is something that is, uh, that is difficult. Uh, Aki outlined many of the reasons for that uh, before, and uh, it's something we are experiencing on the, on the daily basis. So writing these tools uh, takes a, a lot of time and, uh, and a lot of skills too. So the, Having people that are better engineers, better software engineers than, uh, than we are involved in the project is really something that makes a, a big difference. But uh, yeah, so at, on the other end, it's also really, really worth it. It's uh, when, when we have a new research ID, we are able to implement it much more quickly and to test it and to improve it. So that's, uh, that's great. When we receive a new data set, at the moment, we are able to uh, quickly fit a model to it and to run Bayesian optimization on top of it too, even if it's a bit of a non-conventional problem in the first place, just because these tools are modular enough. And uh, maybe as a, an opening, the next step for this project it would be to improve the interoperability between the toolboxes, uh, to keep building the community. That's something we want to do. Uh, to do more and uh, the last one uh, possibly is to improve the user experience both for people from the outside that want to discover these things or for people inside second mind that are using these tools on a daily basis thank you very much for your attention thank you very much everyone for the for the great talk um
Uh, so if people have questions, uh, you can you can post them in the chat. I'm gonna make the question that uh, remained from the from the previous batch. Uh, that says uh, so. Barbara is asking: Is there a learning path that you recommend uh, more than to learn to learn these tools? Uh, and very practical question. But it is possible to bound the GP hyperparameters during optimization in GP flow. I didn't find how to do that. Okay. Uh, so for the first uh, question um, regarding what's the a good learning path, mm -hmm. uh, we try to have notebooks that describe some simple. Uh, use cases and uh, some notebooks for intermediate use cases and some notebooks for more advanced things. So I think looking at the notebooks that we that we provide is a good entry point. You can get the notebook, download it, try to play with it, tune the parameter, change something a, a little bit. When I have to tackle a new problem, my like, default approach is to go to the closest, the notebook, the most related to, uh, to the problem I, I have and uh, to start from from there. Uh, when it comes to bounding the the parameters, yes, it's something similar to what uh, Senwen presented earlier today. We have transforms for the parameter, and uh, you can apply the transform that will end up with parameters being bounded. So we expose to the optimizer an unbounded version of the parameter, but the one that uh, is used inside the model is the parameter transformed by this link function, like for example the sigmoid, if you want to have bounds. Thanks, Nicola. Um, so I don't see any other questions in the in the chat. No, okay. So we have another one. Um, yes, I, I can see the Q and A now. So I'll, uh, okay. I'll just repeat the, the question. So the uh, the last one is the, is the only one. We, you have yes, the, the last one is about uh, will Mark Flow will be available for use like GP Flow is. Yes, the answer is yes. The release is basically today, right? So you can you, you can go on PyPy, you can go on the Second Mind Labs uh, GitHub. Uh, it may be uh, a bit rough around the edges, like we need to fix some links that are broken and things like that, because this is basically happening at the moment. So uh, maybe give us a day to, to finalize everything. But if you're really curious and want to have a look, everything is already out there. Cool. Thanks. Um... Yeah, I see, there's another question. Do you think uh, Marco Flow will be suitable for application like online and play uh, for GPs? Um, so online updates, um, if you mean, I'm not sure if that means data arriving in an online fashion over time. Uh, and if that's so, uh, yes. Um, because there are different parameterizations that allow us to uh, to to deal and update the posterior its distribution of the posterior process uh, given new data points uh, that allow for fast update. Um, if you meant online in the sense of um, having new data, but not necessarily over time, uh, over the time axis, uh, also yes, uh, but for other reasons, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm not sure what the um, what the people who is asking uh, means. Uh, it's an uh, anonymous attendee, so we cannot just ask that person. Maybe that person wants to clarify in the in the chat, but uh, you gave both answers, so I, I think that should be fine. I'd recommend uh, um, having a look at the models uh, called the uh, CVI in the Markov flow, um, which are a particular class of model. Uh, um, so the, yeah. yeah, so the question was about the time series data. Um, I mean, time series data. So uh, the, yeah, I recommend yeah. checking this uh, CVI model and the documentation. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so we don't have uh, more questions in the in the chat. If you have uh, anything uh, else in mind, we can we can.